Bibles, turn if you will to Luke chapter number 5, Luke chapter number 5, normally on a communion service, in a communion service, I usually typically try to just stay on the communion, just preach about the importance of communion, one thing the other, but this is in my heart and I hope that this is going to help us and I just felt like I needed to stay on this this morning and I'm just going to cover one point this morning, I'm not going to go over that and then we'll go into the communion service. But we've been trying to think in the last two Sundays, this will be the third sermon on, uh, is Jesus the captain of your ship? Is Jesus the captain of your ship? Probably most people would say, yes, he is, without even thinking. They say, well, I know that I'm saved. Well, I'm not asking you if you're saved. I'm just asking you if Jesus is the captain of your ship. Now, we've only looked at mostly introductory stuff so far, but we begin by asking the question, are you eligible for Jesus to be the captain of your ship? Now, there's billions of people in the world today that Jesus is not even the captain of nothing. They don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. But this is the third meeting that some of these disciples, or most of these disciples, are meeting with Christ for around the third time now. That first meeting was an introductory meeting, and there's got to be a place where we met the Lord. That second meeting was an informative meeting. I'm going to make you fishermen of men. But when we get to the meeting that we're reading about today, it's more than about the Messiah. It's more than about ministry. It's more about a mandate. Will you listen to me? Will you respond to me? Will you do what I tell you to do? Will you allow me to be the captain of your ship? You see, that first meeting was about faith. That second meeting was about fishing. But this third meeting is about fellowship. Will we allow Christ to be the captain? Will we get in the boat and let him guide us as we need to go? So who is eligible? Those that are saved. Last week we come back and looked at why should he be captain of our ship? What qualifies him to be the captain of our ship? Well, nobody knows ships better than Jesus. He designed the ark, didn't he? He designed the ark, one of the most uh, greatest boats ever designed that went through the storm, the flood of the earth. Jesus designed that ship, not Noah, but that was Jesus. He knows the ship. He knows the seas. He created them. He knows the sailors. He knows you and I, what we can stand and can't stand. And he even knows the storm. So he qualifies. If you're saved, you qualify for him to be your captain. But uh, Jesus qualifies himself uh, to be our captain by knowing all these things. So now this morning, we're going to try to get into the first point on this message. And I'm not going to talk about who or why, but this morning we're going to look at when when Jesus is captain of our ship. First of all, first of all, now this is awful deep. This is really deep. And I don't know if y'all be able to get this or not. I hope I don't throw this over your head and leave you wondering what I'm saying. But here's number one. If Jesus is the captain of the ship, he is in charge of the crew. If he is the captain of the ship, he is in charge of the crew. Now, I think I think I'm not a mind reader, but I think by looking at most of y'all's faces, y'all are thinking, "Duh, who wouldn't know that?" We all know that the captain of the ship is in charge of the crew. He is responsible for the crew, and the crew is responsible to the captain. So if Jesus is the captain of our ship, then Jesus is in charge of our lives. Would you say this morning that the Lord is in charge of your life? Well, that's what I want to evaluate for just a few moments this morning, is is he really in charge of our lives? Look, if you will, down in verse number 4. The Bible said, now, when he had left speaking... Well, let me go back to verse number 3. The Bible says in verse 3, And he, that is Jesus, entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's. We know him better by Peter, but Simon. 
And he prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land, and he, that is Jesus, sat down and taught the people out of the ship. So he has already asked Peter to take him out into shallow waters, to get him back away from the crowd a little, where his voice would be able to be heard by the crowd that had gathered. So Peter already has him on board. Then Peter has already took him out into shallow waters. But in verse number 4, the Bible said, And when he had left speaking, I do not know how long our Lord preached or taught, but when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon or Peter, Launch out into the deep. Get out of the shallow waters and let's go on out into the deeper waters. And when you get out there, he said, I want you to let down your nets for a draw. Is he the captain of our ship? If he is, he must be in charge of our lives. Three things that I want to highlight this morning, three questions I want to ask you and ask you to ask God to help you to, to see if he is the captain of our ship. Well, first of all, I want to say this. If Jesus is the captain of the ship, he ought to be in charge of the little things in our life. The little things. Now, the Lord didn't say, all right, Peter, now that I'm done preaching, bring the boat to land, and I want you to hop on a ship and go to Africa and be a missionary. He never asked him to do anything big. He never asked Peter to do anything that was going to be mind-boggling, mind-blowing, something that Peter would never... Uh, forget the rest of his life. God is not, Jesus is not asking Peter to do something miraculous. All he is saying is, I just want you to take your boat out of the shallow waters, out into the deeper waters. Now, Peter has done that all his life. This is nothing new. This is nothing amazing. But this is something that Peter has always done. And this is just a little thing. But let me say this this morning. We're never going to get out into the deeper waters. We're never going to see God being able to do the best things in our life until we learn that He is captain of the little things. You know, if it's big enough for God to speak to our hearts about it, it's a big thing, isn't it? For God to say something and me to think, well, that's just a little thing, Lord. It don't matter where I do that or not. If God speaks to your heart, I don't care how little it looks, it's a big thing. It can be a life changer. We'll never get to the deeper waters. We'll never get to the bigger things until we learn that He must be the captain of the little things in our life. Sometimes we think, well, we don't need to pray about this or pray about that. And, and of course, I, I just believe there's some things you don't need to pray about. I don't believe you ought to pray about tithing. I mean, it's Bible. If it's black and white, why do you need to pray about things like that? There's just things in the book here. If, it, if it's in the book, don't pray and ask God if you should do it. If it's in the book, do it. Whatever it is, in anything. If it's in the book, you don't have to pray if you need to go to church. It's in the book that we ought to gather together more and more as we see the day approaching. God had Israel a place designed when they got to the promised land to go, I mean, into, yeah, in the promised land, a place where they were to meet. God is always required that His people get together. Don't pray about going to church. If you're a Christian, go to church. You, you don't pray about that stuff. But we need to pray about things. There's lots of things we need to pray about. Those little things that God wants us to do can be those life-changing experiences. You know, you may think, well, going to Sunday school is a little thing. But if God puts it in your heart and says, you know, you ought to be going to Sunday school, that can be a life-changer for you. That can be a life-changer for your family. If God says you ought to read three in the old and two in the new or one in the old and two in the new or two in the old and one in the new, whatever they say. But if God was to put that in your heart that you need to read your Bible from cover to cover, that's not a little thing. If God puts it in your heart that you need to pray more, that's not a little thing. And before we can ever get any farther with God, we're going to have to take care of the little things. He is the captain of the ship. He is the creator of the world. But those little things are so important. 
They're so important. We think, well, Lord, you know, that's not that big a deal. I tried it before. And one thing, we give all these excuses, all these things. But he must be the God of the little things. The little things. He must be God of that. Because we cannot go no further. Sometimes we see people and they seem to excel so far with God. And we say, boy, they got abilities that we don't have. We could never be like them. You'll never know. You'll never know. There's people here sitting today that could possibly be a Sunday school teacher one day. But you'll never know if we don't do the little things. The little things that God's asked us to do. Peter, I want you to launch out into the deeper waters. I want you to get out of this waist deep stuff and get out there where it's over our heads. I want you to get into deeper water. It seemed like a little thing, but listen, folks, it was a life changing thing. What if Peter would have said, Nope, Lord, I've been out there on that water all night. And I'm not going back. I'm tired. I've done took you into the shallow waters. I've done sat here through a sermon. I'm going to take you back in. I'm going to the house and get some sleep. That's not that important of a thing anyway. But it was a life changer. Not only for Peter. Not only for Peter. But for the other disciples as well. You see, it's not just about you. And it's not just about me. When we let those little things go, we're going to suffer. But our wives suffer, our children suffer, our churches suffer. When we bypass those little things, those other people got into the bigger things because Peter decided to go along with the little things. So I ask you this morning, is Christ the captain of your ship? If he is, he is in charge of the little things. Jesus himself said, He that is faithful in the least shall be counted faithful in the much. Is Christ the captain of your ship? Well, if he is, you've got to be in charge of the little things, those things that we sweep under the rug and say, Well, I don't think that's going to make any difference. God speaking to you, sitting right there watching that television, say, You need to turn that. You don't need to be watching that. You're a Christian full of cussing. There's nudity in that. You don't need to be watching that. Oh, Lord, it'll be all right. You're never going to get to the deeper waters. You're never going to get to be able to to see what your potential is in this world unless we are obedient to the little things. When God speaks to our hearts, we need to be willing to do it. The little things. Number two. If he is the captain of our ship, not only is he over the little things in our life, but he is over the ridiculous things in our life. They've been out there fishing all night. They've been dropping nets. They've been fussing. They've been griping, no doubt, because they're catching nothing. They need to take money home. The babies are needing this, and the wives are needing this, and uh, we need this, that, and the other. They've been out there all night, and they have caught nothing. And they're, they're fishermen. They're professional fishermen. And the reason they were out there of the night is because that's the time of year, and that's the kind of fish they know you can only catch them at night. It's a foolish thing to go out there and let your nets down when the sun's are shining. I don't know what time it is now. They've come in. They were mending their nets. Probably about had that done. Jesus now has preached a sermon. It may be 11 o'clock. It may be dinner time. But Jesus says this. Not only go out into the deep, but throw your nets over again. Now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. They've been out there all night. They have been casting those nets. They have been drawing those nets. They are tired. They have told all night. They are tired from their labors. You ever been too tired to do what God wants you to do? Help me, Tiffany. Amen. They even raised her hand on that, and next time she'll be on her feet. You ever been too tired? I mean, you know that God wanted you to do something. But you were just too tired. Wonder how that would work on a, a warship. A soldier say, Captain, I'm too tired. He'd find himself in the slammer, wouldn't he? You ever been too tired? They have been toiling all night. They are tired from their labors. They're wore out. They're wore out. And all they want to do is get home and get some rest because they're going to have to get up in the morning and do it again. 
They're going to have to get back out on them boats, get back out there on that sea and cast those nets and hope to catch some fish tomorrow night. And they wanted some rest. It's ridiculous. What you're asking us to do, Lord, is ridiculous. There's no point in this. You ever told the Lord, I ain't no point me going back over there again, Lord. I ain't listened to life six times I went. That's just for preachers, I guess. Amen. You ever been too tired? Has it ever just seemed ridiculous what God wants you to do? Have you had something else you would rather have been doing? The thing of it is, I wonder how many times our excuses have destroyed our experiences. We offered an excuse because it seemed ridiculous. Seemed unimportant. And because of that, our excuses, we never got to experience what God had in for for us, for our families, for our church. We missed it because of an excuse. The experience never came because we had an excuse. We had something more important than to do what God had put in our hearts. We knew that's what we should have done, but we didn't do it. Well, I've heard people say that many times down through the years, man, God put them on my heart for the last couple of weeks, and I've been so busy, and I've been trying to get there, and I never did, and then, pop, they died. And they wondered, you know, if I'd have got there, if I'd listened to God, had I got there, maybe they'd have gotten saved. Maybe something great, but it never did know. Our excuses are robbing us of our experiences with Christ. That's why Christ must be the captain of our Ship. It may look ridiculous. It may look little. But our captain would never send us out on a little mission. He would never send us out to the ridiculous. We know our captain, and we know that he is worthy that we listen to that still, small voice. So I say, number one, if Christ is the captain of our ship, he is over the little things in our life. Number two, he is over the ridiculous things in our life. Number three, just in case I left something out, he is over everything in our lives. If he is the captain of our ship, you say, well, preacher, I didn't sign up for this. I just signed up to get saved. I wanted a Savior. I didn't want a Lord. You can't get it like that. You know, years ago, I think you could go to a car lot and you could pick out a car, and if you didn't want the air condition, they'd take that off. If you didn't want the speed control, they'd take that off. If you didn't want the tendon, all this kind of stuff. But any, any, anymore, it just comes in a package. You just have to find the package that suits you better and just go with the package. They ain't going to change it. And that's the way it is in salvation. When Jesus becomes Savior of our lives, He is to become Lord of our lives. He is the captain or to be the captain of our ship. And that means that everything I have belongs to God. Everything. I mean, you look at this. You look at this. Jesus comes up. He tells Peter, he said, take me out there into the shallow waters. And then he says, Peter, take me on out there in the deep. And then he says, let down your net. Now, what if I come to your house and I said, fix me some liver mush and eggs? Thank you, Billy. What if I come to your house and I told you you need to vacuum your living room? You say, you don't come down here to my place and take over. But I want to tell you, when the Lord comes down here to our place, He is to take over. He is to be the captain. He takes over everything. Everything in our lives. He has took over Peter's boat. He is acting like it's his boat. You say, well, preacher, that ain't Jesus' house down there where I live. That's my house. I want to tell you, when you're gone, Jesus is still going to be around, isn't he? I heard a fellow say one time, it ain't your house. No way. If you don't believe it, don't pay taxes. Whoop! <laughs> yeah. They'll come get it, won't they? But here's Jesus. He comes down there, and he's just taking over Peter's boat just like it's his boat. 
I believe we ought to let Jesus take over our houses, Jesus take over our cars, Jesus take over our bank accounts, Jesus take over our smartphones, Jesus take over everything we got. I'll tell you one thing, you may, the devil may be saying, boy, that'll never work, you'll be miserable. Oh, no, you'll be happy you did if you do it. Not miserable. Remember, he's the liar and the father of it. Not only is he taking over their boat, time out, he's taking over their Time. That's a hard one, isn't it? I tell you, we live in a day, years ago, a man, a fa somebody would rather give you 20 minutes than $20. Money was hard to come by. But nowadays, people would rather give you $20 any time than 20 minutes. We've got to, I, I don't know why, we don't have to build a fire in our wood cook stoves. We don't have to go to the branch and carry the water. We don't have to draw it out of the wells. We, I mean, you know, we don't, we don't have to do that. We can just go throw it in the microwave and flop it out and eat it in a few minutes. But for some reason, nobody's got any time anymore. No time. Well, I'll tell you, I'd love to come see, but I just ain't got time. You know, I, this, the, blah, 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 ain't no, time is something we say we don't have. But I want you to notice, Peter... He needed to get home and rest. He needed to get home and sleep. He needed to get back tomorrow night and make some money. But he gave God the time. Give him your time and you'll have more time. Amen? If you will give him your time, you will have more time. He's a good captain. He's a good savior. And a lot of things is falling apart and flipping upside down and going haywire and we ain't got time, but is he the captain of our ship? If he's the captain of our ship, you'll probably find out that you will have more time when he's the captain and you just take off the bars and just be the sailor. Amen. Amen. Okay. He took over their boat. He took over their times. I believe you could say he just took over their lives. Their lives, he took over that. He took over their nets. He took over their day. <laughs> he, he just went up there and acted like he just owned it all. And he does. He does. He owns everything. It's all his. He's just letting us use it, enjoy it. Be blessed by it. Borrow it. One day, we're not going to need it. There's a day coming that I'm not going to need a house at 654 Pleasant Hill Church Road. There's a day coming I'm not going to need a suit to wear. There's a day coming I'm not going to need a car to drive. There's a day coming I'm not going to need Walmart any longer. Praise God, there's a day coming that I'm not going to need any of this, but I'm going to always need Him. Always going to need Him. He is the captain to be the captain of our ships. So I ask you this morning, could you say that you are letting Jesus be in charge of the little things in your life? You're doing the little things that God asks you to do. Would you say that Jesus is in charge of the ridiculous things in your life? When he asks you to do something, you just blurt out, Lord, I can't do that. Lord, I, I, I can't do that. I'm not interested. I ain't got time to do that. Don't have the talent to do that. I, I, I can't do that. Can you say that he is God of everything in your life? You see, this thing about being the captain of the ship may sound easy. It may sound minor. It may sound like a very small subject. But when you look at it from a biblical standpoint, you wonder in the day's day how many Christians are really trying their best to allow Jesus to be the captain of their ship. Tell them what to do and do what he says. Obey his voice. What was it the songwriter writer said many years ago? Trust and obey. There is no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. This morning I ask you the question, is Jesus the captain of your ship? I think it's a lifelong struggle. It ain't something that you can just settle on a Sunday morning. It's a lifelong struggle. And there's always those temptations not to do the little things or the ridiculous things. We've all, we've all failed. 
But I believe we could all agree that it is so important that Jesus be the captain of our ship. Imperative. If we're going to go any farther, we're going to have to let him be the captain.